Welcome to the lesson on the five drivers of globalization. In this lesson, we dig deeper into the historic wave of global trade that began in the 1980s and continues today by discussing the five main drivers of economic globalization. The first driver of this second wave of globalization is the liberalization of trade and investment. As we saw in the previous lesson, international trade and foreign investment have surged since the 1980s. This was due to a conscious strategy by governments who decided that economic development could be led by successful export performance. This strategy of export-oriented industrialization led governments to support more liberalized trade and to promote their export sectors of the economy. The World Bank tracks data across countries on the amount of exports and imports they have relative to their output. If we look at the world map of this data for 1973 and compare it to the map in 2020, we see that the amount of international trade relative to economic output rolls in almost every country and attained high levels, especially in Europe, Africa, and North and South America. How do countries expand their exports? This is a subject debated by policymakers. Different countries have accomplished it in different ways. One common policy measure is by agreeing with other countries to lower tariffs and other barriers to international trade. The Bretton Woods Agreement did not deal with international trade. This was handled by the 1947 General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, commonly referred to as the GATT between 23 industrialized countries who agreed to reduce barriers to international trade over time. But the big shift occurred in 1994 when the GATT expanded to include over 100 countries and was renamed the World Trade Organization, or WTO. This map gives a visual sense of how the world of liberalized trade has grown over time. Traditionally, it was thought that trade liberalization would create competition for companies and their workers facing imports from overseas, which could now enter the country without regulation or tax. But as the World Trade Organization agenda expanded, this aspect of trade regulation became secondary to a whole other set of objectives, many having to do with supporting the right of companies to operate to protect their intellectual property, to expand the financial services they offered, and to have some guarantee of being able to bring profits home safely. Thus, globalization has been skewed to consider the interests of multinational companies and has paid much less attention to worker well-being and economic development and industrialization. Economist Danny Roderick has observed, this new set of liberalization goals served the interests of large firms seeking to export their goods or services to foreign markets. In his essay, What Do Trade Agreements Really Do? Professor Roderick says that, quote, rather than reining in protectionists, trade agreements empower another set of special interests and politically well-connected firms, such as international banks, pharmaceutical companies, and multinational corporations. Professor Roderick's assessment holds for many regional trade agreements, such as the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, among the US, Canada, and Mexico, and for global agreements in the World Trade Organization. Although the WTO has announced a goal of improving conditions for economic development in its most recent round of negotiations, the areas of focus, including intellectual property protection, liberalizing international banking rules, and investment guarantees, continue to be skewed towards the interests of companies, and mainly those from the industrialized countries. The second driver of modern globalization is the great doubling of the labor force. Let's start with the question of labor, and what economists call labor supply, the number of people looking for a job. Key here are wages and politics. Let's first consider the issue of wages. Companies searching to pay lower wages is not a new thing. But why do developing countries have such low wages? One reason is that they have lower productivity, less output per each worker on average. They may have relatively more people with a minimum amount of education. They may also lack the capital infrastructure, machinery, buildings, transportation networks, to make workers productive. But many countries have caught up in terms of education, and capital and technology have become more internationally mobile. Now let's turn to politics. An additional reason for the globalization of production is that the world's wage labor market grew considerably over the past 50 years, in particular 
with the collapse of the communist bloc of countries and the privatization of many businesses in the 1980s and 1990s, and then dramatically with the entry of China into the world capitalist system. The People's Republic of China remains a communist country in its political system. Its political sphere is dominated by the Chinese Communist Party, but its economy can only be characterized as capitalist. Private enterprises have boomed. Multinational corporations from the US, Japan, and Europe have flocked to China. Many of these former communist countries now are members of the European Union and the WTO. China joined the WTO in 2001, and in the past 20 years, India has opened its borders to foreign trade and investment to a degree not seen since it became independent in 1947. The entry of these countries into the world economy has meant new markets for producers around the world and new sources of competition for low-wage goods and services. The overarching effect of the entry of these countries into the world capitalist system is the addition of 1.6 billion workers into the global workforce, what economist Richard Freeman has termed the great doubling. With such an expansion of world labor markets, combined with the greater international mobility of capital, it is perhaps not surprising that wages have been stagnant in many parts of the world, as workers from various countries have been placed in greater competition with one another. The third driver of modern globalization is the feminization of the workforce. There was a global shift in manufacturing, from high wage to low wage locations that occurred at the end of the 20th century in many sectors, from apparel to automobiles to consumer electronics. An important feature of the expansion of the labor force was the massive entry of women into manufacturing work. This feminization of the world labor force meant that not only were more countries involved in global production networks, but that in each country more people, women, were working in these jobs. Economist Guy Standing refers to this process as global feminization. And he shows how already in the late 1980s, the exports surged from developing countries, often emanating from special tax-free zones called export processing zones, relied heavily on female labor. In the apparel sector, women accounted for 70% of workers in Bangladesh and Jordan, 80% of workers in China and Vietnam, and 90% of workers in Indonesia. The fourth driver of modern globalization is an increased international mobility of capital. Capital is the money and equipment that companies own to produce goods and services and to invest in financial assets, all aimed at increasing profits. As we have learned, labor earns wages and capital earns profits, an important feature of the post Bretton Woods era, unconstrained by the discipline of the dollar gold standard, was an explosion in the flow of capital around the world. This increase in international capital mobility resulted from the massive financial deregulation that took place, starting with the introduction of flexible exchange rates, and then becoming an explicit policy in many countries and even part of the international trade liberalization agenda. Countries could borrow from and lend to foreign banks much more easily. They were encouraged to open their financial markets to foreign capital, and even government borrowing from overseas surged. One way to look at this from a big picture perspective is to observe the rise in foreign currency transactions that have taken place each year. In 1995, these transactions valued $1.18 trillion per day. By 2019, there were $6.6 .6 trillion per day of foreign exchange transactions. These numbers are hard to imagine. But in some ways, this is the most revealing measure of globalization we can find in the official data. Most important is that it, this represents a huge increase in the international mobility of capital. Financial transactions increasingly dominated in many countries, but also internationally. In essence, capital moves internationally to seek a higher return or a more diversified and therefore less risky portfolio. The fifth major driver of globalization is technology involving automation and technological advances, especially in communications and transportation. Creating machines that could do the work of many humans faster and with fewer mistakes meant that less labor was necessary for production than it had been. The machines also do the skilled tasks, and so the labor that is needed performs relatively simple tasks. 
Skilled labor is needed to maintain the machines, but this is a small number of people compared to those who previously had to be experts in cutting and gluing and controlling quality. This standardization of the production process that came with mechanization meant that production could be located almost anywhere in the world. Mechanization also changed conditions around the delivery of the product to the retailer or customer that also promoted globalization. Pressurized packaging meant that time to delivery mattered less and thus delivery could be from any distance. And most importantly, the development of very large-scale international shipping containers made it very inexpensive to move goods around the world. Some have argued that the invention of the shipping container has been crucial to the globalization of production in the past 20 years. These five drivers of globalization brought on a historic level of global exchange and capital mobility and a qualitatively new form of trade. Note that more globalization shouldn't be confused with a better world economy. Sometimes the opposite is the case. The hyper-globalization of this second wave teaches us that we must move away from the conventional views on how to manage the global economy if people are going to come first. In this lesson, you have learned about the five drivers of globalization. In the next lesson, we will explore the economics of outsourcing as well as power in global value chains. Mm -hmm.